Why do people go bald? Why are baboons bums red? What's a light year? Why do leaves go brown in the autumn? Why do monkeys like bananas? Why do some things glow in the dark? Why do animals not understand? Why do minus heat stay after a year? Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant and Chris Smith. So what's new in the world of science? Well, I suppose the big thing this week, people are still talking about swine flu. Mm -hmm. And this week's news was, of course, that the number of cases that were declared, and these are diagnoses largely clinically made, in other words, doctors listening to symptoms and examining patients directly rather than taking samples and testing them in the lab. Mm -hmm. But the numbers were slightly lower this week all because largely school children have gone on holiday and we're expecting the numbers to go up again when the schools go back. But it's good timing, really, that there's a paper this week in the journal Science, and this is by two researchers in America. It's Jan Medlock, who's at Yale, and also Alison Galvani, who's at Clemson University. And the two of them have said, actually, let's look at the guidance that governments all around the world are putting out about who should be vaccinated. Because when we do eventually get the swine flu vaccine, we know that initially it's going to be in short supply. And so governments all around the world have felt a bit of pressure to come up with some kind of strategy and decide who we should put at the top of the list. And usually featuring on that list are people who we traditionally view as vulnerable, people who have some kind of pre-existing chronic disease like a chest disease or heart disease, kidney disease and so on. But what this group of researchers have done is to say, well, The strategy we're taking is to vaccinate those people because if they do come into contact with flu and we've vaccinated them, they'll have a better outcome. But maybe what we should do instead is to say, well, wouldn't it be better to stop them getting the flu in the first place or Mm. even coming into contact with it? And if we can break the back of the transmission cycle of flu, that would be a much better way to handle the problem. So what they've done is to build a computer model. What that means is that you have a simulation that runs in a computer which uses various parameters, including things like how many people will get the flu in a season, how do people interact with each other in different age groups, How many people will therefore have the opportunity to pass on flu? When you give these people a vaccine, how many of them will be protected? When people get the flu, how many will die? How many will become seriously ill? How many days off work will there be? And this enables you to build a computer simulation of what will happen in, say, America, which is where they based the the sample, but it's probably Mm. extrapolatable to most Western countries. And using that model, they were then able to feed in various parameters to work out, well, what should we actually do about vaccinating people? And a really interesting pattern emerged because every time when they ran their simulation, what they found was the computer suggested that the people we should be vaccinating are the age group 5 to 19 years and 30 to 39 years. And you say, why them? And the answer is that in all of the models and studies that have ever been done on things like the flu, the sole determinant the biggest overrepresented, disproportionately large number of transmissions occur because of school children. It's because lots and lots of children get together in school every day. Children are vulnerable to lots of infections because they don't have any pre-existing immunity, so they get really infectious. They also pass those infections on to their parents, mm. and the parents then take the infection into the workplace where they interact with lots of different age groups, and that's how it gets out. And what this model is showing is that if we give flu vaccination to the school-age children and to parents of school-age children, so in other words, the bracket 30 to 39, Mm. you can actually break the back of flu transmission and stop it spreading. And when they looked at the numbers, they found that with just 65 million doses of flu vaccine in America, where they normally use 85 million, they can actually stop flu spreading altogether. Hmm, all right. Well, that looks like something. I mean, do you think that's ever going to come into being? Well, what this does is, for the first time, begin to give us a way of preempting and predicting what flu will do in a population and what kind of impact or what kind of difference you can make with your vaccine strategy. Previously, it was largely ethically driven. We decided that we, there were people who we needed to protect and we thought about protecting them 
uh, from direct contact with the flu rather than breaking the transmission chain. Mm. And this is taking a slightly different approach, which is quite exciting, really. But there is a, a caveat. And I spoke to one virologist at, at the University of Cambridge today, and I said to him, how did he feel? And he said he thought it was an exciting piece of research. But at the same time, um, he wondered whether pushing the virus into a genetic corner like this, putting it under very strong selective pressure, might make it actually change for the worse. So obviously there are mm. ups and downs to mm. both sides of the argument, but I think this is certainly an interesting idea and it will be interesting to see also which countries decide to embrace it. Um, what about um, what about something else? I mean, flu, we've had nothing but flu, but what else has been new in the world of science as well? Well, let me ask you a question. Um, when you go for a walk in the woods, do you ever get lost? Yes. Usually because <laughs> well, I'm trying to find the dog. <laughs> yeah, but sh- sure. Been there, done that. You're in good company. And it goes back historically, actually. Mark Twain, we've all heard of Mark Twain Mm -hmm. because of the wonderful books he wrote, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. He also had a book called Roughing It, in which he suggested that people go round in circles when they get lost. So did J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings man. And so did Hollywood. If you ever watched the film Flight of the Phoenix, that was all about people going round in circles in the desert. And the point about this story is that no one's ever subjected this claim to scientific scrutiny. So a group of researchers in Germany decided that's what they would do. This is Jan Suman, who's with the Max Planck Institute over in Tübingen in Germany. And what he and his colleagues did was to unleash some lost walkers and ramblers in an unfamiliar forest and tell them to walk in a straight line whilst they tracked their movements with GPS. So they could see where the walkers were going, but the walkers didn't know where they were going. Mm. Now, of these six people who they started studying first, four of them did the challenge in a sunny environment. So in other words, they could use the sun to navigate by, and they tended to walk in a pretty good straight line. Mm. But two of the subjects did it on a cloudy day, and they went hopelessly off course. And the GPS, if you look at the paper, it's beautiful. You just see these spirals on the map as they go round and round in circles, crossing their own paths many times, thinking all the time they're walking in a straight line. They then did the same experiment in the Sahara Desert. They got two people to walk across the Sahara, part of it, in the daytime, and they got another person to do it at night time. Now, when the sun was out, which it was in the Sahara during the daytime, of course, those people went in a straight line, didn't have too much trouble doing that. At night time, when the guy doing that could see the moon, he was fine. He walked in a pretty straight line. But as soon as the moon disappeared, he went off course, started walking in circles, veering round on himself, almost went through 180 degrees, going back the way he'd come. All the time, though, thinking he was going in a straight line. Wow. So why do we have this strange tendency to go round in circles when we get lost? I mean, that's the key question, isn't it? Mm. Now, in the past, people have speculated that maybe human beings and other animals have a natural innate tendency to turn in one direction because it sounds a bit stupid, but this is what people thought. One leg might be longer or stronger than the other. So to formally test that, what these researchers did was to blindfold their volunteers Mm. and then they also tested how strong their legs were they even x-rayed the legs of one of their subjects to prove that it was just one millimeter difference in length between the two legs and they repeated some of the experiments with the people blindfolded which meant that the only thing they were relying on was their body telling them which direction they're going in when they're blindfolded Mm. and they found there was no equivalent bias in the direction that they tended to turn in compared with when they got lost. So what this shows is that it's nothing to do with body asymmetry, making you want to turn in one direction. It's just your brain's navigational machinery going off kilter. And what they think is going on is that your brain and your mechanical uh, motor system, sensory system, your balance organs, make little mistakes every time they're second to second, step by step, working out where to make you go. And as a result of that, this neurological noise accumulates as you're walking and with nothing to reset the compass, such as the sun to navigate by, you go off course. And when those those uh, differences and mistakes get big enough, that neurological noise makes enough of a distortion in, in your brain's calculations. People go in giant circles. So what this is telling you to be aware of is even though you might think you're going right and you're not sure um, that you're going in a circle, you probably are. So unless you've got a sun or another landmark to navigate by, the chances are you will go wrong. So therefore, the best thing to do if you do get lost in the wilderness is to either stay put or follow the sun. All right, so there's no, no such thing then as a good sense of direction. <laughs> it would appear not. That's the point. Yeah. All right, OK, well, let's get to our first question tonight. Agnes in Braintree has called in, and uh, she would like to ask a question about um, lymphedema. Have I got that right? 
Indeed, Think, lymphedema. Yep. Lymphedema. Is there any solution to it? Well, what is lymphedema? When the body is supplied with blood, what's happening is that you have blood at quite high pressure coming from the heart down an artery, and the arteries turn into small arteries called arterioles, and they flow into even smaller vessels called metarterioles, and then they become capillaries, which are very, very fine very thread-like vessels with very thin walls and blood goes through them quite slowly and this means that gases and waste products from the tissue move into the blood and oxygen and sugars and other essential nutrients move out of the blood and into the tissue. But because the pressure at the arterial end of a capillary is, is quite high still, what tends to happen is some of some of the water gets squeezed out of the capillary through tiny holes because the walls of the capillaries are actually full of holes. And that water goes out to become what's called tissue fluid, or lymph. At the other end of the capillary, near to the veins, the uh, pressure is much lower. And so some of that water gets drawn back into the capillary because of the action of proteins in, in the bloodstream which can't leave the capillary. And they exert what's called an oncotic effect. And they pull this colloid oncotic effect, pulls water and other fluids back in from the tissue into the um, capillary but it doesn't pull all of it back in. And this leaves a small amount of the fluid, about 10% of the fluid which left the capillary in the first place, in the tissue. So you have to dr drain that away or scavenge that back somehow. And this is where a new class of tubes we haven't met yet, called lacteals and lymphatics, actually come into play. These are they're a bit like veins, and they have valves in them, but what normally happens is that they just act like little drains or sumps, and the extra tissue fluid goes into them, and they then collect the tissue fluid and bring it back into the core of the body and then add it back into the bloodstream up at the top of your rib cage, up near, the, um, up near your left shoulder. Mm. And th th in that way, they collect all this excess fluid. Now, if for some reason the lymphatic pump, in other words, the ability to draw off this lymph, doesn't work properly then you will get the excess fluid that was filtered accumulating in the tissue and it will swell, and that's called lymphedema. So if something goes wrong with your lymphatics, you will get swelling. If for some reason you make too much fluid in the tissue, more than the lymphatics can cope with, you'll get swelling. And if there's high pressure on the veins, for example, uh, stopping blood moving back out of the piece of tissue, you will get swelling because this will exert back pressure and force more water out, again overwhelming the lymphatics. So that's what lymphedema is. You can also get it when there's not enough protein in your blood to draw the water back in, um, to pull it back inside the capillaries, and that can happen in a variety of conditions. So that's why you get lymphedema. In terms of treating it, uh, you would obviously need to deal with the cause. So if the cause is blocked up lymphatics, and that can be because of things like cancers, it can be because of parasites. There are certain worms that live in tropical countries that make a beeline for your lymph nodes. They block them up, and this stops the fluid draining out of the tissue, and you get a condition like elephantiasis. So mm. dealing with the parasites is another way to deal with it. Mm. Or dealing with the blockage in the vein or the high pressure, which is putting too much fluid out into the tissue in the first place. So the treatment is symptomatic. Um, another way of dealing with it is to increase the pressure in the tissue and wearing stockings that put pressure on the tissue, and these are things like TED stockings, as mm. they're known, mm. these squeeze the tissue, make it much harder for fluid to leave the capillary in the first place, and therefore it stays in the blood vessel and, and goes out of the limb, and that helps to get rid of the problem, and also elevating the body part, so gravity gives you some help. Mm. That's another way of doing it. Mm. All right, Agnes, well, we hope that's helped you as well. I've got another question here, which has come through from uh, Mike, who says that... Um, could you ask um, Dr. Chris, is there a limit to the number of mobile phone frequencies? Well, the answer is yes, because the way a mobile phone works is it's using microwaves to send a radio signal with your voice to the base station. And the base station is using a different frequency to send the voice of the person calling you to your phone. And this means that the, obviously each phone is taking up a little bit of the radio spectrum because microwaves are analogous to radio waves. And this means that there's a limit to how many phones that you can have because each phone needs to be separated from and on a different frequency to other phones, otherwise they're going to interfere with each other. Now, one way that cell companies get around this problem is by creating a cellular network. 
Now, rather than having just a small number of frequencies and then putting everyone on them and then people getting horrendous interference or having a small number of phones because there's only so much radio bandwidth, what companies have done instead is to divide the country up into a number of what are called cells, and these are effectively hexagon-shaped geographical areas, and at each of the vertices you put a transmitter, and in each cell you have a range of frequencies being used, and in all the adjacent cells you use a different range of frequencies. But in the cells beyond those adjacent cells, you can use the same frequency as in the first cell again because it's far enough away that the signals won't interfere with each other. And by making this sort of mosaic where you vary the frequencies so that no two adjacent cells use the same set of frequencies, you can get the whole country covered and packed into a very tight bit of radio bandwidth uh, without actually suffering and causing interference. And it's when you cross from one cell to the next that your phone has to contact each of the masts and say, right, I need to retune and change my frequency to you. And that's why if you're driving along in the car, for example, sometimes you'll hear your phone making interference on the radio and that's it contacting the base station and setting up the signals and working out who it's going to talk to and in what order. So the answer is yes, there is a limit to how many mobile phones you can pack into each bit of radio frequency, but by dividing the area up into small cells and keeping the power down on the phones, that way you can pack many, many more phones into the same bit of radio frequency than you would otherwise be able to. Interesting stuff. All right. Uh, one from Mark in Bletchley it says, Can you ask Chris, what's happening to the brain when I say good morning when it's night, although I mean good night, or I say it's a bit hot when it's cold? I tend to come out with the opposite to what I mean. Does that make sense? And uh, is it a shift work thing? Mark in Bletchley, who works shifts. Chris? Well, I think I do that. <laughs> I do. Um, there's this thing called reverse psychology, isn't there? If I say to you, don't think about purple kangaroos, the first thing you see hopping through your mind's eye is purple kangaroos. Mm. It could be that Mark knows he does this, tries to prevent himself from doing it, and then unfortunately a little bit of mental interference means that he then comes out with the very thing that he didn't want to say. And it's a bit like that scene in Bridget Jones when she's trying to introduce Mr Fitzherbert, who is the lecce sales director oh, of yes. the publishing company she works for, and she keeps on hearing in her brain, tits pervert tits pervert and then says Mr. T uh, 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 Mr. Fitz Herbert eventually it's a huge mental struggle to get it out I suspect that, that that's partly uh, what's going on um, and it may also be that in some people there, there is a sort of um, antagonism between different words because when, your brain probably organises things that are related together so night goes with day um, tired goes with awake and uh, alert and so on so that you know what things are opposites and, and maybe it could be that um, sometimes you accidentally get them swapped around because the connections that lead to one also lead to the other because it's diametrically opposed and it might be that occasionally the brain makes the wrong word choice it's a bit like a sort of tip of the tongue experience but you find a word but it's the wrong one if you're enjoying Ask the Naked Scientist, then you might like to check out The Naked Scientist, our regular roundup of the world's best science. Each week we take a look at the latest science news, talk to top researchers working at the coalface of discovery, and also get our hands dirty with a science experiment that you can join in with too. So make it a date and prepare to strip down science on the web at nakedscientist.com slash podcast. All right, we've got a caller on the line. We've got Tony on the line. Hello, Tony. Hello, my dear. Lovely to hear you again. Thank you. I've heard you for a while getting withdrawal symptoms. Oh, dear. Well, I'm here I for did. you, Tony. So is Dr. Chris. What's your question? <laughs> right. With heart attacks, does stress cause heart attacks? And if so, why? Uh, well, two, two things here, Tony. Um, stress can be thought of in two ways. Acute stress, so in other words, you're fine one minute and then a, a balloon goes pop and it makes you jump. Uh. That's an acute stress. And then there's chronic stress, whereas if I hate my job, I hate my life, I'm chronically in debt and people are chasing me for money and um, I'm miserable all the time, that would be a chronically stressful life. And those two things are different and they both impact on health in different ways. People who are chronically stressed and chronically depressed tend to have very high levels of stress hormones in their bloodstream. This can contribute to things like high cholesterol levels and high fat levels, 
People also tend to use drugs if they're in that condition, or they may drink too much. They may also not tend to eat healthily. They may exercise less, and they sleep less well. All these things contribute to high blood pressure, and this contributes to arterial disease, and that contributes to a heart attack. So chronic stress is definitely consistent with an increased risk of heart disease. Acute stress, on the other hand, the balloon going bang, you get robbed in the street, someone jumps out, makes you jump. Uh, something like that, something unexpected, uh-huh. that can trigger heart attacks in a different way, which is that when you are made to jump and you go, oh, like that, and you, f- you feel butterflies in your, in your chest, your tummy feels odd, and you may take a very deep breath or go, oh. When that happens, you are releasing a very big surge of stress hormones, adrenaline, into your bloodstream. And what this does is it puts your body into fight-or-flight mode. The body gets ready because it thinks it's going to have to do some action. This is the action of adrenaline. One of those things is to very quickly increase heart rate, and it may double, even in some cases, triple heart rate. The other thing it will do is to increase blood pressure and increase how hard the heart actually beats. It's not just beating faster, it's also beating harder. All these things increase the demand on the heart, and if you already have an underlying heart problem or a blocked vessel supplying blood to the heart and you suddenly increase the workload on the heart, that could precipitate a cardiac arrest or an abnormal rhythm in the heart including a cardiac arrest and that in itself could then lead to damage to the heart or loss of life so the two things can be thought of as two two different manifestations but they can definitely both precipitate heart problems lovely thank you very much all right thank you very much um here comes um, alan i believe hello alan yes hello dr Hi. sue Oh, Dr. Sue. <laughs> I'll just be matron. Um, you're through to Dr. Chris. What's your question? Yeah, well, basically, as we look around now, particularly in places like garden centres and that, we see more and more solar-powered gadgets available for the garden and various places. But it doesn't seem to be the massive take-up on people's houses. And I was wondering if there was anything that was holding us back. Hi, Alan. Hi, um, p- Part of the problem is price. Solar panels and solar infrastructure is quite expensive and it doesn't necessarily pay for itself in terms at least of electricity generation very quickly. Um, There are not very many incentives at the moment for people to plumb these things in. In Germany, for example, they will pay people uh, for the energy that they return to the grid. In the UK, that is not necessarily the case. So Mm. in some places it can be, but not as a general rule. So even though you might be generating a surplus of electricity, this will help to offset your electricity bills a bit, but you won't make a fortune. Um, When I asked Dr. Carl, my friend from Australia, who uh, is a radio broadcaster and has just turned his house into a massive solar array, he said the time it would take him to recoup the money he was saving by generating quite a lot of electricity was 250 years. So it's not financially... Uh, an incentive for people at the moment mm. for making warm water which is obviously a very different technology this is where you have a, a black membrane surface that transfers the sun's energy into water yeah. and this can help offset heating bills that's a lot more economical in terms of uh, wallet sparing effect and that is that is worth doing but it's not generating electricity it's generating warm water which restricts what you can do with it obviously to a certain extent mm. so if we got a, you got a house and you're building a new house and it was incorporated into the price of the new house, wouldn't that be a viable proposition? Definitely. And if you look at where most of the carbon budget goes on the population of a country like Britain, about 40% of the CO2 that we chuck out individually every year just goes on keeping our houses warm. So when we build new houses, people are trying to make sure that the houses that they put up are very sensitive to saving energy, and they scavenge as much energy as they can from the environment and release as little as possible. And this includes keeping themselves cool in summer, so you don't have to use aircon, and warm in winter, Mm. and doing things like using solar arrays on the roof to warm up the water. So people are doing that. And in fact, we did a show on The Naked Scientists. It was a year ago now, but we did actually look at a new development which is being plumbed in. Uh, I think it's down in Surrey. And they are building houses which the idea is they're going to be energy neutral. So they are going to be net uh, non-users of energy. They will actually produce as much electricity and warm water for their own uses as they actually consume. So they should be uh, carbon neutral. All right, honey bun. Thank you very much. Okay. 
It's Dr Chris from The Naked Scientist taking your calls, your questions. Sandra is on the phone. Hello, Sandra. Hello. What's your question to Dr Chris? I would like to know uh, something that um, I heard the other day relating to pond plants, oxygenating plants. Mm -hmm. I've always been told that um, if you have oxygenating weed in your pond, then it takes in carbon dioxide and produces oxygen to help oxygenate the water to keep fish alive. Mm -hmm. I recently was told, oh, that only works in the day. At night, plants produce carbon dioxide. Now, is that correct? Hello, Sandra. Hello. The answer is yes, it's absolutely true. Um, Plants use the process photosynthesis to use the energy in sunlight to drive a chemical reaction that enables them to split apart a molecule of carbon dioxide, link it with a molecule of water, and you do that a few times and you turn six molecules of CO2 and six molecules of H2O, water, Mm -hmm. into one molecule of glucose, C6H12O6, and a byproduct, oxygen. You get six molecules of oxygen off, and that's what you see bubbling out of your plant. But in every cell that's living in a plant, and also in you and me, you're also burning energy because you need to live. And so plants will be using some of that glucose and reversing that chemical reaction. So they burn one molecule of glucose with six molecules of oxygen and that produces six molecules of CO2 and some water. And the problem is that at night time when there isn't any sunlight, the only process happening is that energy burning process. So plants are net consumers of oxygen and emitters of CO2. But during the daytime, when they've got lots of energy coming in from the sun, they're making more than enough oxygen to offset their own demands. And so what you see bubbling out is what's left over, the excess. So in your pond at night, if you've got a warm day, the amount of oxygen that can dissolve in the water is lower when the water temperature goes up. This means that you can get to a critical point where there's not enough oxygen in the water that when night time comes and the plants start using their share of the oxygen, the tension drops really, really low and then the fish can actually get starved of oxygen. And the way to make sure that doesn't happen is to plumb in something like a little waterfall or something because the what this does is by dropping water into the water, it it mixes the surface of the water with air and some oxygen dissolves and this keeps the fish happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, well, Anna in Ipswich asked um, that something that's puzzled her for years. Accent. If someone comes from the north, the south or Wales, you can detect an accent. However, when we sing, with very few exceptions, the accent disappears. Why is this? Well, that's because accents are actually a learned behaviour. When you're a child and you're learning to speak, you learn by imitation and you copy the way that your parents speak. And what is speech? Well, what you're doing is making your vocal cords vibrate and this is making a humming noise and then you change the shape of a resonator, in other words, the the tube, it's a bit like an organ tube, to make a different sound. And this is exactly what you do with your mouth. You change the shape of your resonator, your mouth, and as a result you get different sounds coming out. And you do that in quick succession with movements of your lips and tongue and this makes different sounds which we hear as different letters, words and so on. Well, when you learn to speak you copy your parents and therefore you make those sounds the same way they do and you have an accent but when you're singing what you're doing is producing um, a lot of sounds very very fast and you're not necessarily learning to sing the way your parents sing you're learning to sing to make a musical sound so you're actually achieving a different thing than speaking and that's why it's possible to sing in an apparently unaccented way The only giveaway is occasionally when you sing in a foreign language because some of the words just don't seem to come out quite right. Mm. Um, But on the whole, if you you listen to that that song Golden Earring, um, Radar Love by Golden Earring, you have to listen quite carefully to know that those Dutch guys singing that aren't English. And similarly, a lot of people sing and almost sound American. And purely because they are trying to make themselves sound like the person they're imitating who happens to sing like that in an American band, for example. So it's all about imitation. That's all accents are. Now, um, some more questions coming in. Heidi has some T1. She says, how do 3D films work and why do we have to wear glasses to see it? And also the little luminous bracelets that you get from fun fairs. What is the glowing stuff inside and is it harmful to consume? Chris. Okay, let's look at 3D films first. Uh, The way this works is that what you do 
is in the old days they used to do it by projecting two different uh, colours largely onto a screen. So you have a red and a blue set of glasses. And by projecting two images side by side um, and you choose your colours that you project in such a way that the blue glasses will screen out one of the images and the red glasses will allow it through and vice versa. So the two eyes see two different images slightly displaced from one another and because the brain sums together what it sees it reassembles these two different images and you see a three-dimensional image which is exactly what you see when you look at the world normally and so what you see is you experience the movie in three dimensions because you're seeing instead of something on a flat screen in two dimensions you're seeing two images which is the same as what your two eyes would experience in a 3d world um, in more recent times what people do is to use uh, polarising lenses. So when you go these days, you might get uh, things that are a bit like sunglasses to put on. And what it's doing now is is they're beaming two images in the same way, which are overlapping but just slightly off from one another. And they are slightly different polarities of light. So when one of them goes through the polarising lens, it gets cancelled out, but the other one can go through on the other eye and vice versa, and it achieves the same effect. So that's how you actually are, are creating a three-dimensional experience. That's why you have to wear the glasses. Uh, if you take them off, you'll see the two overlapping images, and it looks very bizarre, and you, you get a sort of vague gist of what you should be seeing, but it looks very, very weird. Um, the second question was about those funky things that you get at fun fairs, those mm. glow-in-the-dark glow sticks and stuff. This is a chemical reaction. Um, it's, it's a couple of chemicals. One of them's hydrogen peroxide, and the second one is an ester. Uh, usually this is something called phenyl oxalate ester. Um, this is an alcohol stuck onto uh, another chemical, an acid, an organic acid. And the hydrogen peroxide breaks down and oxidises the link between the uh, alcohol and the organic acid and breaks that chemical down. And in the process, it produces reactive species of chemicals which get fed into a dye. And this dye, uh, class of dyes, is called luminol. And the dye molecules get excited by this chemical energy and some of the electrons in the dye molecules get kicked up to what's called a higher energy state. So the, the electrons get energised and they then fall back to their original starting position and in the process they spit out the energy that they were given but at a very specific frequency or wavelength. And so you see them emitting at a certain colour. And that's how you make different colours, because you put molecules in that will soak up energy, uh, their electrons will absorb energy and then therefore give out energy at certain wavelengths of light. The choice of chemicals that they use are based on the fact they're relatively non-toxic. Hydrogen peroxide will make your eyes sting, um, but, if you, if you, but if you look at it in your bathroom and you wear contact lenses, you'll see that it's the same stuff that you're actually cleaning your contact lenses with. So hydrogen peroxide is a relatively safe oxidant, and the phenyl oxalate ester, I think it tastes disgusting apparently, <laughs> but I don't think it's that nasty. I think you'd have to eat quite a lot of it in order to, to be really quite sick. So those chemicals are chosen on purpose because they are relatively safe. All right, well, we've got a little bit of time left, Chris. Um, just um, one here for, on the text from Steve. says he suffers from tinnitus. Um, if he eats food high in salt, the symptoms go. Does this indicate normally low blood, blood pressure? Chris? Uh, well, tin tinnitus is uh, a manifestation of the cochlea, which is the organ in your inner ear which converts sound waves into brain waves, not working properly. And there are some conditions which are linked to there being an insufficient amount of a fluid, which is uh, that there are two fluids which flow around in the air, this perilymph and cortilymph. And if you don't make enough of these chemicals, these, these ultrafiltrates of blood, then what this can do is interfere with your balance and it can also interfere with hearing. It might be that when Steve eats extra, extra, extra salt, what he does is to drink extra water because it makes him thirsty and perhaps this contributes to extra fluid in the ear and this offsets this problem. It might be worth getting it checked out to see if he's got one of these conditions. They're quite rare, but um, there are conditions where you don't have the right amount of these fluids in the ear and uh, this can contribute to these sorts of symptoms. All right, well, Janet wants to know why, when it's a windy day, why does the wind drop at night usually? Um, the, the answer uh, to where the gusts of wind come from and why does it stop being windy at night is, well, if we look at what wind is, wind is a mass movement of air and you get wind, not you personally, but in the environment, when you have a high pressure area and wind flows from that high pressure area, air is pushed by the high pressure towards the low pressure. So in other words, you have movements of air from high pressure to low pressure. 
What makes a high pressure area or a low pressure area? Well, temperature. So if you make a gas cold, it shrinks. If you make a gas hot, it expands. So if the sun shines on a certain bit of the earth, it will add heat to the land and this will add heat to the air. The air will expand and the pressure will go up. This will therefore have a higher pressure and the air will try to move towards a, another cooler area. This is why you get, say, a sea breeze. So you tend to get a sea breeze in the afternoon because the sun warms up the ocean surface. This puts heat into the air. The air then warms up because of ev evaporating water, giving energy to the, to the air, and this then flows towards the land and you get a sea breeze, which sailors know very well. Um, so towards night time, of course, the, sea the heating effect of the sun goes away, temperature drops, and therefore this uh, heating effect stops, and so the wind tends to calm down overnight. If you, it, it's the reverse of the sea breeze effect, that's the answer. That's it for this week. Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. <laughs>